Uh, I'm really looking forward to this today. It, it is going to be about my uh, new book, and, and the new book has many of the things that you've seen before that I've presented, and I have expanded upon them and have done some uh, new and very interesting things with them. And uh, what I've done is to try to pull together all of the best evidence that we have today that we continue to live after the body dies. We have tremendous amount of of information now. There's no doubt about that fact. And we just have to get it out to the world because even when they ask for essays about the, the, the fact that it's true, we don't get essays that contain all of the evidence that we have. So we have a tremendous amount of evidence. And, and what I want to do is I want to present some of the highlights to you. I'm going to be focusing on the, the things that are recorded so that you can listen to them and uh, see them. And uh, in that way, you can see what's the most interesting, but there are other things in the book as well. So when we talk about what the best evidence is, whether we're, we're talking about the whole population and 300 million people, or whether you're talking about a group of five or six, mm -hmm. it all comes down to the evidence that the life after this life is true, that is convincing to me. Everyone comes back to the individual. So we can have a group of, that are individuals, and so then what I'm going to be focusing upon is how can, what is the evidence that will tell me individually, personally, that the, the life after this life is reality. And so it's all in the book. And I'm going to try to give you a, a really short glimpse of it now. Now, there are many areas of evidence that we have personal materializations. Those are the most uh, evidential, physical medium materializations, direct and any point of this independent voice conversations, personal extended ITC contacts, transmedium contacts, mental contacts, automatic writing contacts. And those are things that are that will happen to the person and the person will have the experience of believing that it's true as a result of that. Secondary areas of evidence are where we hear about those things from other people. We hear about mental contacts and listening to direct and independent voice recordings and hearing others extended ITC contacts. And so, we have hearing recordings of physical medium contacts and hearing accounts of mediums and trans mediums. And all of these things are areas in which we have evidence that is uh, simply incontrovertible that we continue to live. We also have signs. We have evidence from the nature of reality. We have surveys and studies that, that show that people do realize the reality of the afterlife, that it's not an uncommon phenomenon. So we have great volumes of information. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to be looking at the information uh, and I want to see these things in, the, in this, the evidence that we have. The experiencer verifies the speaker, is known, and the content is known. It's characteristic of the person. The voice is clear. There is extended dialogue. The memories of the experiencer are confirmed. The person knows about current events. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to one of the ones that I used before, but with a new look at it, the Dr. Dinshaw and Angie Nanji tapes. And uh, there are others that are coming from Leslie Flint, Alice Fearon and her son, Michael, Ira Conacher and her husband, Douglas, and David Kontnack and his mother. And those I went through before. So I'm going to go back to the Dr. Dinshaw, Nanji, and Angie, Nanji, Andy, Nanji. And what I've done is I've gone back to them and I've gone through every one of their presentations that they, he had done with Leslie Flint. And I've looked for those things that are evidential that it shows that Annie is alive today, that Annie is seeing what's going on in Dr. Nanji's life. She talks to him about it. And so it's evidence that she continues to live on even though her body has passed away. So that's what you're gonna be hearing today. This is the first one. This is when, when Annie comes in, uh, Dr. Nanji comes in with Flint and Andy, Annie then comes in and speaks to him about a ring that he has in his pocket. You have got my ring in your pocket. Yes. And I also will. the lock of hair. Yes, I will be think what thing to use with me. All the various things yes, associated with us both. Yes. Okay, what's important about the, those, that evidential recording is that Dr. Nanji verifies the speaker's Annie, her voice is recognizable to him, they have extended dialogue, they share memories with each other, Annie knows of curtain things, current things that are going on, he's got the lock of hair and the ring, and the contact is repeated, he comes back and has more. Here's another example. This is Annie talking about the gravestone 
where her grave is. And you know the gravestone yes. where you have put your name, but yes. you are not there yet. No, but... <laughs> but you, have, you are very funny. Yes. I have to laugh at you. Yes. You have uh, on the gravestone, yes, I you know. have got my name and yes. date, and now you have got your name, but no date. No date. Because you don't know when you're coming. Yes, exactly. But you will be able to have the date put in when you are yes. here. Yes, that's right. You will make arrangements for yes, you. There is room for yes. you. Yes. But you man. won't be there. You will be with me. But it seems so strange that you should have already arranged to put your name on the stone when you are not there yet. That's delightful. So here's another one. In, in this case, Annie is actually looking in on Dr. Nancy's flat. She sees what's going on in his flat. And she makes comments about it, showing that she is still very much alive, that she's with Dr. Nancy when she wants to be with him. And she notes things about his life. This is what the recording. And you haven't changed anything. Nothing. Everything in the flat is identically the same no. as when I left it. Exactly. And there is a difference, though. The yes. bed cover. Yes. The one? The bed cover. The bed cover, yes. What is that? Something different about the bed cover. You, you, you bought those bed covers, darling? I know. The yellow ones? Yes. Yes. But, um, have you done something to one of the bed covers? No, darling. They're both identical. Well, perhaps it is that... They are the same bed covers, but yes. there is something different. Uh -huh. I don't know why. Uh -huh. Perhaps it is the way I see it. Yes. But uh, they are very nice, and because you bought them, I, I like to... I know. You keep everything exactly the same. Yes, I like to use them. But um, I think you... Are you sure you have it the right way around? Uh, that may not be. <laughs> I think yeah, I am yeah. right. Yeah. Because I think you've got one of the... When you have the bed cover, it is not always the right way right around. Right. That may be, yes. I'm certain that is so. Yeah. But I, it doesn't look right. Yes, Danny. So, so uh, Annie is there in his flat with him, and she sees the bed covers. And what happens then is in the next session, which is six months later when Dr. Nanji comes back, she, they remark about the, what happened with the bedspread. I think you have made a difference with the spread of the bedspread. <laughs> oh, yes, I, it was so. I have even taken photos of the bedspread with half side on the wrong side and half side on the right side. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes these silly things are very good because there are things you don't think about and they are important in a way yes. to prove, you know? Yes. And we are near, of yes. course. Yes. This is another example. Uh, in this case, Annie is attempting to communicate with Dr. Nanji at night in his flat. So she taps, she makes taps and he hears them and he responds. And this is her account of what happens. Because you know, I hear your tapping. Good. And I'm surprised at myself that I can hear it. I always know when you hear. Yes. Because you always acknowledge it. Yes, exactly. And you always say, thank you, darling. Yes, I know. And I again this is another example they and she says that she is constantly with him she is spending time with him all of the time so there are some pictures that she would like to see in the flat and so she's still involved in his life she's still liking to do decorations within his flat and so she tells him that she would like to have him put up those pictures I don't have to tell you. I am with you constantly. Yes, Daddy. Every day I come and spend some time with you, yes. especially in the evening yes. when you are quiet. Yes, Daddy. In the apartment. Yes, Daddy. Ah, everything is very much the same. You have not altered anything very much. No, Daddy. And you're going to put the pictures over the bed. Yes, Daddy. Just as we would wish, huh? Yes. So then the next time that he comes, she remarks about the pictures because she's watched him put them up. I am so thrilled with the pictures. Yeah. You have got them in a very good prominent position. Yeah. And you know sometimes you see the light around them? Yes. The light around the pictures? Yes, I do. I do little things, you know, to try to tell you I am aware yes. of little things. And yes, I know. And things, yes. You know. I know. So she's able to communicate with him. She taps, she puts lights around pictures. She does other things to attract his attention. So she's very much alive and very much a part of his life. This is another example. She sees him going to the cemetery and goes to the cemetery with him. 
Why do you still go to the cemetery? Well, darling, how can I pass your birthday without my... I appreciate it, but I'm not there. Time. I am not there. No, no, I know that. And uh, I see you go there, and it makes you depressed. Yeah, I, no, no, I'm not depressed. No? No, 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 I'm not depressed. And the flowers. But, but, the, but the fact that I have cleaned it up and... and Put the bushes round. I know. Oh, I see you. I watch yes, you. I was there. It and I think I, I was there a week ago. I, I, the only time I'm ever in the cemetery is when you go there. Yes, yes. <laughs> so this is another example. She actually went to a gathering of people, an assembly of people that Dr. Nanji was at, and she describes what happened with the group of people there. I, I was with you all day yesterday. Hmm? Yes. It was very nice. And I was very kind, you know. Yes. She is very good, yes. you know. Yes. And she does everything for you, yes. you know. Exactly, yes. And uh, the cake yes. and everything. She sent love up to you. And I know. I will be talking to her, I hope, again. And she took about 10 pictures right out of the I will talk to her. Yes. I will communicate with her. And she said, well, you do communicate. I will you and tell you that the miracle has happened. <laughs> well, I hope so. It is not for want of trying. No. I do my best, you know. Yeah. Everyone here helps, you know. Yeah. I am very fortunate to have so many friends. In a very good form because we were absolutely alone the whole evening. And that is better, perhaps, huh? And, uh, because Mr. Bird is not interested. No, he's not interested. And he has to go out. Yes. So we were together. Yes. At the pictures. Yes. I did pose. Yes. I posed for the, by the pictures, you know. Well, I, I hope something will happen on those Well, I w want to. I try. You know. yes. I hope so. They've yes. taken about 10 pictures. And, uh, I like all you know, I bring my pictures to you. Yes, darling, I, I've given her the same pictures. You have? Yes. Oh. And I'm going to give the manage also. You are going to give him a picture of me? Yes, sir. Oh, he will put it with his pictures in his room? Yes, he likes it very much. Good. You are going there today, are you not? Yes, I'm going there. I shall be with you. I used the... Uh longer version when I put the recording on I had to actually shortened it for the script so that's the reason we missed some of it uh what she says is that that uh, she is with him she is seeing what he's, he's doing and she's going to be with him the next day when he goes there this is another example and this is, example shows that she not only knows what he's doing and is, is with him she actually knows his thoughts and his feelings and so this is what she realizes about him when he sees a woman that looks very much like her. You know, the other day, yeah. before you come here, yes. you were walking along the street, yes. and you saw someone in the distance, and it reminded you of me. <laughs> okay. And for a moment, you almost stopped, you know, as if your heart stopped beating. Yes. You knew it was not me, in the yes, way, but at the same time, she was very like me, yes. and also the way she moved, walked, yes. you know? Yes. Uh, but this, of course, is... I do you know, I, I thought mentally, yes, she looks like her, but she hasn't got her brain. Ah, um, no, you shouldn't <laughs> say that, you don't know, she might be highly intelligent. No, I don't know. You know, you always think, oh, you are so naughty, she, this woman was very much like me. I think she probably was highly intelligent. Okay, there was a little more of that one too. Uh, this is uh, one that I wanted to bring to you. It is uh, more of the same, an example of what is going on in their lives, but this is, this is a touching one because of the fact that it, it shows that she didn't think that they had any children. The two of them had no children. And when she did arrive to the life in the afternoon, the life after this life, she found that she had two children. The children had been miscarriages. And this is the account and, of... And uh, how long ago you before you uh, come in contact with Sibylla and Peter? 
Well, that was almost immediate. But, immediate. but the point is, I know it sounds strange now, but mm. I could not realize at uh, first uh, that there could be any children. Yeah. Because I thought to myself, this is impossible. Yeah. I mean, it was not that I did not accept in a way, but I, I thought, well, you know, how can this be? But you, you knew there were with yes, I know, but you must remember yes. that when I was on your side, yes. like most people, everybody, yes. they don't you care. don't think of children yes. under those circumstances. That's right. And, and uh, uh, when I arrived here, uh, they were here, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, of course I was happy with, to be with them, or to know of them. But, but did the children know that you were their mama? Yes, you see, this is very strange. They knew, of course, that we were connected, that I was a mom, the mama. Yes. Uh, but I never had any children, as far as no, I was I concerned. Mean, physically. And uh, yes, you see, I could not at first accept the idea. And I then, mean, it's very difficult to put into words what I want to say. Ah. And does that happen with all the children who are in the world today? Uh, do, do they return to their mama? Um, I don't think in every case. Not no. in every case. There must be uh, I think unless there is a great bond. Yeah. I mean, if there is a tremendous uh, love, yeah. then that is a different thing. Yeah. But so many, uh, well, <laughs> are not of yeah. love, you no, know? That's right. So that was a wonderful account. So what... The next area that I want to explore with you that's in the book is uh, having people have extended ITC contact. Uh, and I have the reference in the book, and I'm going to give you the account of it and then play one, a couple of the examples for you here. Uh, these ITC contacts have been happening regularly. Uh, now, Sarah Estep has actually had a contact over the phone. Konstantin Raudova, who was a pioneer in EVP, called her on the phone and spoke to her. And so we have the recording of her speaking to him. We also have a recording of her speaking to Mark Macy and speaking. Uh, uh, we don't have a recording of Sonia Rinaldi, but he co contacted Sonia Rinaldi as well. So what you're going to hear now is you're going to hear Sarah speak about her, her phone recording, and then you're going to hear the phone recording of Konstantin Raudova 20 years after he had passed away. On the first part of this tape, you will have the opportunity to compare the telephone voice of Konstantin Raudova, early Latvian taped voice experimenter who died in 1974. These calls were made to three EVP experimenters in the United States. The first segment, lasting 40 seconds, came through my telephone at approximately 10.45 a.m. on January 27, 1994. My telephone rang normally. I was sitting at the desk in my office working. When I picked up the receiver, a clear male voice said, This is Constantine Rodaday. I quickly pushed the record button of my Sano tape recorder that is connected to my telephone and asked, how are you, Dr. Radeve? This explains his first remark as my tape recorder began recording. I'm as fine as a dead one can be. It is important to note he heard my question and responded to it in an appropriate way, perhaps showing a dry sense of humor. After that, he went on to complete his message, calling me by name and again saying his name at the end. You will then hear me say, thank you so much. You will notice there is no dial sound as he ends his contact, which you normally hear under usual phone call conditions. Others who have received phone calls from the other side have also remarked on the absence of dial tones. proud and honored that 
already could contact you. I must interrupt now. This was the first contact. This was Constantin Narodil speaking. Thank you so much. In a second recording, you're going to hear George Meek with Constantine Radva. The second segment on the tape is a phone call. George Meek, developer of the Spiritcom system, and now living in North Carolina, received on the same morning as mine came through. <laughs> Good morning, this is George Meek. This is Constantin Raudifer. George, my friend, at last we succeeded in contacting you. Then had this beside me, and she wants to give you all her love. This is Constantin Raudifer. This is the first contact you get from us. I suppose that you can hear me. I can hear you very well, very plainly. Fine, so this is the beginning of a new story, a new chapter, George. You are a very good friend of ours, even if we haven't met. We will continue this. This is the first bridge we succeeded to build to the States. Mark was contacted, and I must interrupt now. Uh, thank you, dear friend. And this is the third contact, but it was not, he didn't manage to get to Mark Macy. He left a, a phone voice. The third segment is a phone call Mark Macy of Colorado received on February the 11th, 1994, through his answering machine. Mark had received a phone call several days before George and I did, as well as Walter Uphoff of Wisconsin. Unfortunately, Mark and Walter did not have a tape recorder connected to their telephone, as George and I did, so could not record Radave's voice. In his second call, however, to Mark, as already mentioned, Mark found the message on the answering machine after he had been away from home a short time. Mark called George after listening to the message, and George confirmed Radave had called him earlier that day. What's important about these recordings is the fact that he identifies himself as Radova. The listeners know about him. He knows about things that are going on in their life right now. So that means that Radova is very much alive and he's able to communicate and he's come through ITC by making phone calls. And we wish we could get more of those phone calls, but uh, I'd like to have had the one with Sonia Rinaldi, but I, she did not record hers. And would like to have seen what he had to say to her. But as you know, Radova came through in a David Thompson seance and spoke with her. The next example I'm going to give that also shows the fact that the person on the other side is somebody who has lived on, on the earth plane and now is very much alive, even though the, his body is dead, is Doc Mueller, who was a NASA scientist who had passed away and, uh, in, in 1967. And then in the 90s, he spoke with Bill O'Neill, who's a medium, and George Meek, who created Spiritcom, which is an electronic device that enables the person on, from the life after this life to speak through. And so you'll hear 
the recording of Doc Mueller, who is a NASA scientist, speaking to Bill O'Neill, and you'll see Bill there at his equipment. And what's really interesting about this is that Doc Mueller is giving Bill O'Neill information about how to refine their recording devices. And so what he did was he gave Bill O'Neill phone numbers from NASA that Bill O'Neill was to call. And uh, of course, Bill O'Neill didn't make the calls because he was really afraid of what he would say to them about how he got the phone numbers. So this is the, uh, this is the account here. It's because of the, the system the way it is, the sound the way it is, uh, you will have difficulty hearing Doc Mueller, but you will hear him. And then I have a transcript beside it, so you can go along with it. I want to know. Listen, could you wait a moment, sir? Very well. Yes, sir. What's wrong? Nothing's wrong, sir. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, sir. I'm just adjusting the frequencies. No, I say you're right very well. Oh, by the way, William. Yes, sir. You're on that cell phone number I gave you. No, sir. Why not? Well, Dr. Mueller, those are unlisted telephone numbers. That's your right. All right, now, if I... Oh, boy. Even though I give, you know, when they answer and I give the code, even then, sir, wouldn't they wonder, you know, uh, maybe there's another code or something, and considering what they're involved in, about that. Yes, but I do, sir. I do worry about that, sir. You know, what? You know, that one fellow especially, sir, that, uh, you said he has a, uh, a Q clearance? That's correct, a secret. His secret, Q clearance. Uh, supposing they found out it was me, okay? And, uh, they wanted to know how I got a, got a hold of the, uh, Unlisted telephone number. Now, who would believe where I got an un these unlisted? Oh boy! <laughs> so he never did follow through and, and make the phone calls uh, because he was worried that, that NASA would come and wrestle him to the ground. So, uh, but you, the important thing is that Doc Mueller, who was a NASA scientist who, who understands and, and he has the phone numbers from NASA, he has all of this personal information. And he relates it then to Bill O'Neill. Doc Mueller is very much alive, even though his body had passed away in 1967. So that's further proof of the fact that we continue to live after the body dies. Now, there are accounts of people appearing to other people. They just spontaneously appear. Now, the, these experiences are described by someone who's trustworthy, someone who knows the experiencer, the witness has tangible sensory ability, has extended contact, describes shared memories, and describes content as showing the person knows about what's going on in their life. And the accounts that I, that I have in the book are from Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, Raymond Moody, and J.B. Phillips. Uh, they are three of the accounts uh, that are the most evidential because these people are people who are beyond reproach. Uh, they, you can uh, rely upon their testimony. Uh, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you one that I did not give you earlier when I spoke about this. Uh, it's between J.B. Phillips uh, and C.S. Lewis. J.B. Phillips was uh, the translator of the New Testament in English, and uh, C.S. Lewis is the author of the Chronicles of Narnia. Phillips was going through an awful time in his life. He felt that God didn't love him, and one evening he received a visitation. It was C.S. Lewis who had passed away some time before. And when C.S. Lewis came, he gave J.B. Phillips a message. And the message was a message that brought him out of his feeling that God didn't love him and took him on the course of being very much, very much healed from the difficulties that he was having. Uh, and then he appeared to him again. So he appeared to him twice. So this is the account. Now, what I've, I've done, this is a written account, and I have a voiceover, so you hear it narrated, and I'll have the account there as well. Many of us who believe in what is technically known as the communion of saints must have experienced the sense of nearness for a fairly short time of those whom we love soon after they have died. 
This has certainly happened to me several times. But the late C.S. Lewis whom I did not know very well, and had only seen in the flesh once, but with whom I had corresponded a fair amount gave me an unusual experience. A few days after his death while I was watching television he appeared sitting in a chair within a few feet of me, and spoke a few words which were particularly relevant to the difficult circumstances through which I was passing. He was ruddier in complexion than ever grinning all over his face, and as the old-fashioned saying has it positively glowing with health. The interesting thing to me was that I had not been thinking about him at all. I was neither alarmed nor surprised, nor to satisfy the Bishop of Woolwich, did I look up to see the hole in the ceiling that he might have made on arrival. He was just there large as life and twice as natural. A week later this time when I was in bed reading before going to sleep, he appeared again even more rosily radiant than before, and repeated to me the same message which was very important to me at the time. I was a little puzzled by this, and I mentioned it to a certain saintly bishop who was then living in retirement here in Dorset. His reply was, my dear Jay, this sort of thing is happening all the time. <laughs> it is happening all the time. It's very common to have people materialize who have been, uh, whose bodies have been dead for a long time. And so we have more and more accounts of these. And as we have the records and share them, people are beginning to realize that people will continue to live. They will be able to come back. They may be able to materialize. They may be able to share something which is of importance to the person living on this side of life. And so this is evidential. This is a very strong evidence of the fact that we continue to live after the body passes away. This is an example of Raymond Moody. Uh, had uh, an experience in which his grandmother came in and talked with him. Uh, this is another narration of the, the text. Uh, you'll recognize, you know, Raymond Moody's voice. It's very distinctive. So this is not his voice. This is a narration. It is very difficult to put this experience into language. I am at a loss to explain some of it in words. Yet I have no doubt whatsoever that I was in the presence of my deceased grandmother for an extended period and did in fact converse with her at length. At first, as I said, I did not recognize this person, though she immediately seemed somehow familiar. She looked somewhat as she had, while alive on the earth, but appeared younger than she had been even when I was born. When I recognized her as my grandmother and confronted her with this fact, she immediately acknowledged it and began to use the nickname she alone had used for me when I was a child. She talked with me about events only my grandmother and I knew. She imparted to me certain very personal information about my early life that has been quite important and revealing, I might add, that the relationship between me and my paternal grandmother had been rather difficult while she was alive. Yet our meeting enabled us to smooth things over. I now see her humor and appreciate her as a person in a brand new way. I look forward to meeting her again when I make my transition. I can attest that my own visit with my grandmother was radically different from anything I have experienced during my two decades of familiarity with hypnosis. As to suggestion, the fact that some subjects in the study described in this source document saw someone other than the person they set out to see illustrates the difficulty in explaining these happenings solely in terms of that concept. So there was a wonderful experience that he had. His grandmother simply spontaneously appeared in the room and spoke with him at length. And, and uh, when she got up and left and they had said their goodbyes just like they normally would, she walked out of the door and, and was gone. And so that's a very common experience that people have. They, they, they spontaneously have somebody appear. It's somebody they know well. It's a demonstration of the fact that we continue to live after the body continue, ceases to function. The other way that we know that we continue to live is from recordings of physical medium contact. Someone known to the experiencer speaks through a physical medium. There's an extended contact. There are shared memories that they have. And the content shows that the person knows about current events and in, in the person on this side of life. life. And so the, there are several examples. Uh, the Sarah and Nick example I've played for you before. Uh, Constantine Raudova has come through. Carlos Mirabelli has had uh, people come through him. Montague Keene has come through in a David Thompson seance. And Helen Duncan's witnesses have in the in court in Old Bailey in London, when Helen Duncan was put on trial as a witch because she was telling the people the secrets that the British Admiralty didn't want them to know. And so she was put on trial as a witch. And now we have the testimonies of the people who are actually in the trial and so we have the witnesses saying, I was with Helen Junkin, and these are the things that actually happened to me. And these accounts have people touching the loved one through the mediumship of Helen Duncan. The people have materialized. They have a full body materialization. And Helen Duncan used a red light. 
So when she used a red light, that means that the people could see the person who was coming through to them very easily. And as a result of that, then they could describe what happened. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you two of the witnesses. And I'm using voiceovers again so that you can hear them as while you watch the transcript. And these transcripts show the fact that these people had encounters with their loved ones who had passed away, who, whose bodies had died, and they actually touched them and spoke with them and they knew it was them. The first of these is Jane Mary Rust, and she was a midwife, and she went under oath and under oath, and she report, reported her encounters with her deceased husband and her aunt. She said that they were true, and she described what happened. So this is her description of what happened under oath. Had you any doubt about it being your husband? No doubt whatsoever. How close up to him were you? As close as I am to this. Did he speak to you? He spoke to me. Did you recognize his voice? I did. I was perfectly certain. Did he say anything to you in particular that struck you as of importance? Just spoke about the family. He said that he was always with me, and he would be on the other side waiting for me. He would never leave me until I joined him. Had he altered in appearance at all? No, sir. He had not altered just a wee bit thinner, perhaps, than he was in health. But my husband was very ill for three years before he went. He said, put your hand in mine, dear, so I gave him my right hand. He took hold of it with his right and clasped my hand very tightly. It was flesh and blood, was it? It was very cold, my lord, but it was his hand. I held it firmly. I felt the knuckles. He suffered with rheumatism, my lord, and I felt the knobbly knuckles. Did he kiss you? He did, sir, right on the mouth. My mother came out and stood on the side of the cabinet. I wanted to be close to her, because I had never been so close before. I wanted to get right in contact. I said, Mother, you are not going back without kissing me. Are you this time? She said, Come here, my child. She beckoned me to her side. She made me stand, and I was standing facing her. She turned me to the sitters and patted my shoulder and said, My loving daughter introduced me sort of thing. Did you touch her? I did. I kissed her. Did she put her arms on you or did you put your arms on her? She put her arm around my shoulders. Tell me a little about her voice. What was her voice like? It was her natural voice. My mother had a mole in the hollow of her chin, and another over the left eyebrow, and without that it would not be my mother, and she had it there, and I was satisfied. I got as close to my aunt as I got to my mother and my husband. She said to me words in Spanish. I replied in Spanish. It was Gibraltarian in Spanish. It was not the Spanish possibly that they speak in Spain itself, but the Gibraltarian Spanish. Did you recognize the figure that spoke to you? Yes, absolutely, sir. She was my aunt, my mother's sister, and I recognized her because she is a replica of my own mother. They were always taken for twins, but they were not twins. So that's testimony under oath of what happened during the Helen Duncan seances. And, and they, the people were able to see because it was under red light. So someone would come out from behind the curtain where Helen Duncan was sitting and they would walk right up to them and they would touch them and put their arm around them and kiss them on the mouth. And so that's testimony of the fact that these people were alive. This is a second witness, James McDougall. He was a jeweler. He wasn't McDougall Duncan. He was not related to Helen Duncan. And he testified that his wife had materialized. His daughter was there near him and, and his, his wife referred to her. So uh, this is uh, an explanation of the fact that she had uh, she would noted that they had talked about going to Canada. She was alive. She was with them. She knew they were talking about it. So this is the testimony for James McDougall Duncan. My wife went to the side next to light and pulled the curtain aside and stood there with the light shining clear on her face. I went up to her and saw her. I was within 18 inches of her. I spoke to her. I saw her most clearly the best I have ever seen her. What did she say? Do you remember? Intimate things. We have discussed certain intimate and domestic things. She knew that we had considered going to Canada to my son there and she told me at the sitting there once, go to Canada. You will be much happier. You will be in better health. Go there. What about the voice? Was it her voice? My wife's voice. What about the appearance? Yes, the appearance of my wife. I lived with her 45 years. I should know her voice and her appearance. 
I have not a shadow of doubt in my mind that the form I saw was that of my wife speaking to me as she used to speak in a quiet voice. She had a quiet voice. How close to you did your father come? I went right up to the cabinet and spoke to him. Because I knew my father. He had a beard and spoke in the voice that I knew well. He was just about my height. I went right up to the curtain too and, my mother, spoke to me. She said, are those the lassies? My two daughters were there. I said, yes. She said, it makes me feel old. Now that is just what she would have said had she been on the earth just the very same expression she would have used. How do you know it was your mother at all? By seeing her and hearing her. I saw her quite clearly. I was quite close to her. You recognized your brothers? Yes. By appearance and voice? Yes. No doubt about it at all? Not at all. Not at all. So that's a wonderful testimony. Of course, we all wish we could have been there and during these seances that, that Helen Duncan had. But uh, we have wonderful physical mediums today who are doing this sort of work right now. So these are the, some of the most convincing evidence of the fact that we continue to live after the body dies. There are also uh, mental contacts. In other words, we, an experiencer appears mentally in, in the self-guided, psychotherapist-guided NDE or dream. Uh, they're described as being real by the person. There's an extended contact and the con con content shows the person is the individual. They reveal information. So these are the people, the psychotherapists whom I cite within the, the document. And uh, I didn't have uh, Jane Bissler on here. She is uh, also in there uh, when I made this slide some time ago. Uh, but what I'm gonna do is I'm going to play for you one of the examples from uh, Jane Bissler's work. Uh, this is a marvelous work that she's actually have, helping people to connect and then teaching them how to make their own connections. Uh, and that is her link down below. I rec really recommend her work. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna play for you a narration. This is from a text, but it's a narration of an actual account of someone who had uh, one of the loving heart connections. There was a light. I think William appeared shortly after that. He looked so good. He was wearing a yellow Adidas t-shirt. Then William showed me this big pink flower, and it was so weird, it was like the flower was alive. It was so fresh and moist. It was like the flower could breathe. There was a lake and lily pads with more flowers, and William said, Lotus Land. He said the flower was a lotus. I never would have known this. Then off a bit to the left there was this amazing show of colors, it was Aurora Borealis. It was not like the Aurora Borealis we have here in Alberta. This was like Aurora Borealis cranked up like you have never seen. It was mind-blowing and magical. The colors were like I could go into the colors. William said he liked where he was. He missed and loved me. He asked if I could come there. He said there is every kind of ice cream there that you can imagine, even cherry chunks and vanilla, which was his favorite. He said our dog, Hershey, cannot yet see him in spirit. Then he took me down a road. It was like I was with him. I could see every pebble. He took me to an old covered wagon. There was a man sitting on the little wagon bench. He was older, had gray hair and a beard, and was wearing one of those hats like they wear in the Australian outback. He was slim, and had on a white shirt and brown pants with suspenders. He did not say anything to me or acknowledge me. The wagon I could see in such detail, that I could see where the cloth of the covered part attached to the wagon part. I could see some loose threads. The wagon was being pulled by two enormous beautiful black Clydesdale horses. They were magnificent. I looked directly into their eyes, and they looked back at me like they were an inch from my face. I could feel their breath, and the softness of their nostrils. They had white fur on their legs, down near their hooves. I could see the fur so clearly, like little bits of dirt in the fur. It was so clear. I cannot describe how clear this was. It was just so amazing. I think at this point I had almost forgot I was sitting in a chair. I was so engrossed in my surroundings. William said he liked riding in the back of the wagon. Then at that point, I could feel William was leaving. He said he would see me later, and he loved me. So that's a wonderful, wonderful experience that, uh, that someone had with Jane. And so I uh, really highly recommend it. Uh, and I'm kind of flying through these. I realize that because I'm trying to get everything in that I can get in. Uh, another example is uh, David Thompson's seances in which David then would have people materialize 
and come through and then they would speak. And these are people coming through and speaking to people who know them well on this side of life. So it's obvious that they had not passed away. <laughs> For example. Hello. 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 Yes, yes, we have. Yes, we have. Yes, yes, Excellent. Who is this, don't you? It's Monty. Of course it's Monty. <laughs> Are you here, Guy? Yes, I'm over here. Oh, good, good. I'm so glad that you were able to be here. Well, me too. Yes. And is that you, son? Yes, it is. Oh, they managed to get to you up here. Yes, they did, yes. Fantastic. It's wonderful to hear you, Morrissey. Does does my voice sound clear? It does. Yes, it's very good. You answered it very well. Well, it's taken me a little bit of time. That's right, my dear. It could be a little bit of time to, to, to get it just right. Yes. yes. Now, I have a few things that I, that I want to say. Yes. Okay. Yeah. To you all. First of all, Guy. Right. It's not like Enfield, is it? Not yet. I'm <laughs> sure you'll do your best. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, don't Indeed. you? Indeed, yeah. It's nothing like Enfield. Well, I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> Do you know, I, I've investigated since I've been over here mm. regarding uh, Enfield to Green Street. I've investigated. Can you hear me? Yeah. And I have to say that you was right in your assumptions that it was the young girl, Janet, Mm. It was a habitually glad, uh, coming into sexual awareness, puberty, mm. that was creating the phenomena. Yes, it did come inside of the earth. Uh, well, yeah. I can tell you that that's what it was. Mm. And, uh, but I, I understand that you're going to talk as my, as my um, day of memory. Yes, indeed. Uh, it seems so silly to say a day of memory. <laughs> but I'm still here, doesn't it? That's right, I'm still here. Yes, yes. Now, I understand that you're going to be talking about my last work. Well, I was going to, but I realized that you did another one since the one we did. Well, yes, yes. Uh, well, you, you were, did, did more than I could keep up with. Them, you know? Do you know, <laughs> I started to get as much flack from uh, some of our members mm. regarding this young man's sales as much as I did for the school experiment. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Same people, I guess. Mm. Yes, you yes. You know who they are. Yeah, they I don't wish to mention them on tape, especially if this is going to be paid publicly. Now I just want to say that my son. And I, I have kind of flown through it. Um, the system is also set up. I had the system set up so that it would make a slideshow and forgot to take the, uh, the interrupts off. So it was going along all by itself. And that's the reason you saw some interruptions in there. Uh, and so then I had to hurry up and catch up with it. But uh, I wanted to uh, go through as much of it as I could and still leave time. And we've got about eight minutes now. And so what I wanted to do was to stop. And, and if you have any questions about it or about any of my books, then I would welcome you to, to go ahead and ask the questions now.